apologize for that. Um, but we are still going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I wonder if maybe I could get three of you to read. Someone to read 1 through 4, and then someone uh, 5 through 11, or 15, and then 16 through the end. If, uh, if we could maybe get three volunteers who could do that in a reasonably loud voice. I think I saw David's hand go up, and then Jerry's hand, and then maybe one more uh, good loud voice who'd be willing to do that. But David, we'll have you read, uh, why don't you read uh, verses 1 through, actually let's have you read 1 through 9, and then Jerry, why don't you do 10 through 15, and then if someone would be willing to do 16 through 23, who'd, who'd do 16 to 23? Any takers? All right, Doris, thank you. So David, would you start us off? Thank you. Um, so we're going to do what we've done the last few times and just give you about three to five minutes to look through this text. And here's where obviously you can't really circle anything, unfortunately. But uh, take a look through. Maybe you want to work with people you're sitting with or sitting near or just do it on your own. Um, and we're looking for about three or four different things here. So any repeated words or phrases or kind of similar words that are recurring throughout the text. Um, if you find any grammatical details like sentence structure kinds of things, or um, finally, Old Testament quotations. See if you can find or identify any of those things. And you might also think, too, if there's a simple way to structure this passage, how would it break down logically? That's a little harder to do in just a couple minutes, but maybe you come up with something. So go ahead, three to five minutes, and look for those kinds of things, and then we'll, um, we'll see what you, what you come up with. <coughs>
one more minute or so. This one is a little tougher, yeah. So you'll notice that sometimes with Paul, his his, and this is true for all of his letters, his the structure and the argumentation that he lays out can be hard to follow. He has this way of building pretty complex arguments and you read through someone like maybe John and it's a little simpler, the language is a little easier and the sentence structure sometimes is a little easier to follow. So um, this is a challenge, this is a, this is a more difficult text. But let's see what you came up with. Um, how about repeated words? Did you notice any words that are said more than say two times aside from you know the a and the and and those kinds of things, the major words, what, what did you notice is repeated? There's a lot of, I heard like three things all at once. So I heard lots of question marks, yes. Um, and that would, that's actually, I'm glad you said that because that's a good example of grammatical stuff where it's a rhetorical question, right? Where, <coughs> mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Um, and we and we do that too in English, right? Rhetor when you ask someone, you know, a question and you're kind of just assuming they know the answer. Um, and so th that's exactly what Paul is doing. He's asking them a question um, assuming that they ought to know better, and and that's a that's a really good example of that grammatical thing, the the rhetorical question. I heard Doris. I think you had said something as well. Uh, what was the word you said? Good. Yeah, because it, if you look through, you see the word building or builder repeated quite a number of times, as well as foundation. Both of those ideas are repeated. So that already helps us come clear in our minds about kind of the image that Paul is working with here, which is the image of construction, right? He's talking about what are we building on, and we're going to come back to that in a minute, but just by spotting that, we begin to see that, okay, there's an image that Paul wants us to have in our minds of what kind of foundation and what kind of building are we constructing. What else? Uh, David? Plant and water. Yeah, especially there at the beginning, right? I plant it, or uh, um, how does he say it? Um, uh, the, what is it, verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, neither he who plants nor waters, he who waters is anything, he who plants and waters, right? So that image, there's the second image that we're working with. Um, and I'm kind of laying the groundwork for something we're going to come back to in a minute. The second image is that of gardening or agriculture, right? What, what kind of crop are we growing and how does it grow? Um, so good. Um, anything else? Any other words that jumped out at you? Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So if you look in verse, uh, I think it's verse, yeah, verse one, um, I could not address you as spiritual people. So he starts off talking about spiritual and then he talks, um, the ESV has it as flesh flesh uh, three times and then human is a couple of times. Now there's where having the Greek gives you a little leg up because you'll see that it's actually the same word flesh or human come back to the same Greek root. So in other words, Paul is setting up a contrast here between spiritual. I couldn't talk to you like spiritual people because you're still behaving like fleshly people. And there's always that when Paul, when the Bible talks about flesh, it's not talking so much about our, you know, our bodies as much as it is our sinful nature. So he's saying you're acting like people who are unregenerate or not born again in Christ. So we're already seeing here we've got the problem, right, the contrast Paul's setting up, 
spiritual versus fleshly. You're behaving more like fleshly people. What kind of foundation are you building and what kind of gardening project are you working on? So we're, it's coming clear already. David. Yep. Wise fool and worldly um, come through a number of times as well. That's right. Um, especially there. And that's a theme. Remember when we said a few weeks ago how every book of the Bible has kind of a, a, a meta theme of that covers the whole book and foolishness and wisdom would probably be one of those ideas that's all through first corinthians is what is true wisdom and it doesn't always look like wisdom in the eyes of the world and paul comes back to that there in i forget which verse it is but um oh in verse uh 18 uh 18 and 19 he comes back to that theme it's like he's trying to tie this to that bigger theme in first corinthians um anything else <coughs> yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Yep, that's right. And you're you're absolutely right. You you pick up very well on that impatience that Paul has with this church. This is not a church that Paul is thrilled with at the moment. Um and incidentally we have well there are thought to be there are four letters to the Corinthian church that Paul wrote, and we have the first and the third, I think is what we think, or the second and fourth. Anyways, there's one letter we don't have where it's called Paul's letter of tears, and in that letter, he really lets them have it, and he's heartbroken at having to do this, but he things were getting so bad that he had to write a very harsh letter um, that brought him to tears, and you're getting a little sense of that here, but it, apparently it got worse before it got better um, with the Corinthian church. Um, did anyone pick up on the uh, Old Testament references? There are two of them that I found. Bruce found them, I bet, yeah. So what did, what did you find? Um, mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So now we don't have time tonight, but if you were going to do a little more in-depth, you'd want to go back to both of those places and dig a little deeper because, again, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it doesn't just have that one verse in mind. Usually it's meant to refer us to the whole context. And then when we get the whole context, it makes even more sense. So, yeah, that's that's good. Okay, let's um, flip to the next slide, Haley. Um, we covered some of this already, but let's, let's talk and see if we can answer this question. What is the big picture problem that Paul is describing and Paul is concerned about here in this text. What's what's the real issue that he's trying to correct? Yeah, Jerry. St spiritual maturity? Yeah, I, I, and, and how is that spiritual immaturity showing up in the church? What is the symptom of it? Divisions, that's right. And how do we know that? What do we see in the text that lets us see what that what that is? Yeah, David. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, re and remember, Apollos was one of the people in Corinth, and Paul came alongside and worked with him. And now, all of a sudden, it seems that some of the Corinthian church are loyal to Paul, and some, well, I like Apollos better, right? And you almost, to put it in contemporary language, this would be like a church that maybe has a co pastorate situation, and which can be a very good thing, a very positive thing, but it can also, if you're not careful, it can lead to this, well, you know, so-and-so is a much better preacher, and, well, we really like them, this other pastor, because they're a more effective, you know, pastoral caregiver, or something like that. And so you've got a church that is divided, and uh, loyalty to, uh, split loyalties among the church. Um, and I think uh, the second question there, how does Paul characterize the problem? And I think that's what Jerry was getting at, which is, this is a spiritual maturity issue. Um, and that's why he uses that language, and we kind of touched on that already, but the first four or five verses there, fleshly, human, this is an unspiritual way of thinking and behaving. This isn't just a question of, you know, personal taste and preference. This is a question of spiritual, a lack of spiritual maturity when you favor one over the other. Um, and so, yeah, the divisions that uh, that are resulting in the church because of it. So, um, Haley, let's go to the next slide. 
Um, how does Paul connect um, spiritual growth with the problem of disunity? What, what do you, how does Paul describe that? How does he work that out for us? <clears throat> Any thoughts on that? Yeah, David. Right. Right. So maturity brings about this recognition and sort of the spiritual eyes to see how growth comes about. Right. From a human perspective, you might look at one person's leadership style and tactics and so on. But ultimately, Paul says that's a worldly way to look at things. And that maybe takes us back to the theme of wisdom. Worldly wisdom says it's all about the human ability and ingenuity and creativity and leadership style and so on. And Paul says, no, from a spiritual point of view, it's God who is the one who brings about the growth. And therefore, there's no room for party loyalties, as you put it, David. That, that's a good way to put it. Um, how does, and maybe, maybe I better not get ahead of myself, because the second question there says, how does um, spiritual growth, as we grow in Christ, how does that create unity? How, does that, how is that meant to um, cause us to come together as, as believers? What do you think? Mm-hmm. Right, right, exactly. To recognize that each, you know, in the Corinthian case, you've got two leaders at minimum, maybe more. Um, he mentions later on, he mentions Peter. But to recognize that each person is being used by God in different ways because they've been differently gifted. And so it's learning to see that spiritual side of things, right? See what God is doing behind the scenes. Yeah, good point. Right, that's right. Where it belongs, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's why Paul says, look, I planted an Apollos water. Those are um, questions of agency, of, of, you know, you're doing something, but ultimately you can water something all you want, but it's God who brings the growth, and therefore God gets all the credit, right? <coughs> right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and we're, we're workers, we're laborers, we're not the engineers of the growth, we're the ones who serve on God's behalf, and um, uh, God is, it still gets all the credit. Yeah, good. Um, anything else on that? Any other thoughts on how spiritual growth um, promotes unity within the church? All right, then let's go to the next slide there, Haley. <coughs> Um, what is the foundation that Paul talks about? Um, I should have put the verse reference up there, but it's a verse. Um, he starts off in about verse 10 talking about this foundation. He says, like a skilled um, master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. What is Paul talking about there, do you think? Repentance and baptism? Okay, what else? Other thoughts on that? Right, yeah, Jesus Christ. I think that would be, and, and repentance and, and regeneration and such come into that. But I, I think I think James is right that the ultimate core bedrock foundation is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, I laid the foundation, but the foundation is the gospel. And then repentance and um, you know Christian living are built on that. Um, so yeah, it's, but Paul says it's, you know, the foundation is not, in other words, me, Paul says, or Paulus, it's Christ. Christ is the foundation. What is, yeah, go ahead, Doris. Right, yeah, I think so. Um, or laying another foundation might mean a different gospel or different teaching or some other philosophy, which Paul condemns other places. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, what is the end result of our labor? As Paul talks about this, what is kind of the, the big picture that Paul has in mind for the church? What does um, God see the church becoming? Or Paul see church becoming? Mm-hmm. Right. Yes, that's right. I'm glad you said that. that um, and I'm going to come back to that more in a bit because that was one that got me thinking a little bit like, I hadn't looked at this. So there's there's some reward there that, that Paul is thinking about for God's people and for those who labor for the kingdom. Um, yeah, Margie. Hmm? Yep. Mm. 
Yes. Yeah, mine does as well. And that's usually a way of talking about um, a specific, the day of judgment and the day of, of reckoning. Um, so just maybe I'll just take a minute and kind of unpack that right now. If you look, um, it's, this is where it's really hard to follow along with the logic because we, you know, if you're just reading straight across the page, you might miss some of the connections. But um, in verse uh, 12, Paul talks about two kinds of foundations there. The first one is uh, gold, silver, or precious stones. That's like the precious foundation, okay? Then the second one, um, wood, hay, or straw seems to be the less valuable kind of foundation because those kinds of things are all consumed by fire. And then if you jump all the way down to verse three, uh, uh, to verse 17, Paul talks about, he says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will s- destroy him. That seems to be talking about a building that will not survive the judgment. So if you follow along with me, um, the first foundation of gold, silver, and precious stone seems to be what Paul picks up in verse 14, where he says, if the work anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a, a reward. So that seems to be a foundation that survives through the fires of judgment and refinement and purification, right? Gold, silver, and precious stones actually can make it through a fire and they are purified. Then in verse 15, Paul says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. That seems to be a reference back to wood, hay, or straw, which is a foundation that doesn't make it through the fire, but the person nevertheless survives. The the person will, we say, sometimes makes it into heaven by the skin of their teeth. Paul seems to be talking about those who labor and um, they labored on a foundation or they labored in such a way that maybe wasn't as faithful to the gospel or not as productive or something. And their foundation, their work won't survive, but they are still one of God's redeemed people. And then the last one is those who oppose God's work in the world. And those are the ones that where Paul says God will destroy them. So three kinds of foundations there. Three ki- No, James says no. Well, okay, yeah, so say, say more about that. Building on top of, yeah, if the work anyone has built on the foundation, you're right. One foundation, but the work on top of it. That's, a, that's right, I think you're right. I think I misspoke there. Um, so what you're building on top, the gold, silver, or precious stones, the hay, straw, or wood, and those who then destroy what's built on it. Um, now the question becomes, um, what is that work that is built? What is the gold, silver, and precious stones referred to, or the wood, hay, and straw, or the ones who destroy it? So what is the building referring to? What do you, what do you think about that? Okay. Things that can't and things that will be and things that then oppose it. Okay. Let's, to, be, to use a horrible pun, let's be more concrete, right? Uh, what other, what might that refer to if, uh, if we interpret the metaphor? Okay. Okay, right, yeah, yep, yep, yep. I think that's right. I think it's the idea of, right, that's right. I think you're right. I think it refers to the labor and the service that um, that we do, whether it's good, faithful, obedient, not perfect, like you say, but um, done in service versus... Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So then the question becomes, what kind of builder are we now? Um, David had a question, then I got... Right. 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 Yeah, that's right. So you connect it to the bigger theme of the whole text, which has to do with unity and party loyalty. Those who are um, causing these divisions and promoting these divisions, this may be Paul's way of saying, look, I'm not going to come out and call you unregenerate, but I am going to say you're building with straw, wood, and stuff that is not going to survive God's final judgment. You might make it in by the skin of your teeth, as, as we might say today, 
but you're building with shoddy material here. You're laboring with shoddy material. Now the question for all of us is, is Paul only talking about um, leaders in the church or is he talking about the whole church? Is he talking to every believer when he talks about those who are laboring? Um, yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully that's right. Yeah, and I, I would agree. Um, and Haley, why don't you go to uh, two more slides forward? There, there we go. So, verse uh, the second, the first question there: How does Paul's language um, warn servants who labor for God's kingdom? Right. The warning is: Be careful what kind of material you're building with. Are you, are you laboring to really edify and build up God's church and His temple? Are you building on that foundation in such a way that it's pleasing to God without? without saying, well, I have to be perfect or else. I mean, all of our labor depends on the work of Jesus Christ, but um, are we laboring in such a way that we're doing it to please God? Yeah, Jerry. Well, I, I would, right, right. I would say that um, we are all, I mean, we're saved by grace, but then the question becomes, how do we labor? And the labor is not a means to our salvation. But it's, it's an outworking, right? It's, it's an expression of this faith and relationship we have with Jesus Christ. It doesn't secure our, our eternal reward. It's, it's after we're saved. Now, there, that is always that tension that we live with because um, we don't want to ever say, well, you can be saved by grace and now it doesn't matter at all how you lived because you, know, you got your ticket to heaven, as it were. We don't want to say that. But we also have to be careful not to add works to the equation in some way. So um, I don't think Paul is doing that. I think he's saying you are, you know, you are part of this temple now. You are, by grace, you become part of the building crew, um, but be careful how you're building. And I think he's, that's where the warning comes in about if you're using shoddy materials to build on that foundation, it's not that you're not saved, it's that you're, you're being careless in how you're living as a part of that temple. Um, David. Right. Yeah, that's right. I think that's a good way to put it. This is Paul is addressing a matter of sanctification and Christian growth as opposed to justification, being made right with God. So, um, you know, we, al we always have to sort of be cautious on both ends. We don't, it's not salvation by grace alone, plus a little bit of works thrown in there, but it, it's all, it's all grace, but it's grace that leads to a life of obedience. And in, in God's sovereign working that is sometimes hard to understand, he allows us to be faithful or not, right? There are people in this 